welcome to the first live event of VR All Art. Uh, we are hosting to today uh, two very important people. One is Johan Berge from the gallery Artemorphosis from Zurich. The second one is uh, our artist that is presenting a virtual exhibition today, Pedro Pablo Livia from Cuba. So, Johan, um, welcome. Welcome to our first live stream in art. Hello. Of an opening of a virtual reality exhibition. Today we are opening a retrospective exhibition of the last five decades of creative work of an outstanding Cuban artist, Pedro Pablo Oliva. Our agenda for today is we'll first hear some welcoming words from the maestro directly from Pinal del Rio, Cuba. Then we'll switch over to Vito Mir uh, in Serbia, Belgrade, who will be actually opening the virtual exhibition so we can all enter and start looking at the exhibition. Uh, from there on, you could actually walk around and see the exhibition in your own speed and in your own interest. But I would suggest you stay, I recommend you stay for a while because then from Pinal del Rio, We'll have Silvia Oliva, and um, uh, she will introduce us into the studio of the artist. And David Orta will comment about three important works of the master, who have, which have never been displayed outside Cuba, and probably never will be displayed outside Cuba, unless magic happens, like this is today, where we can present those works for the first time outside Cuba with virtual reality. After that uh, presentation, we will switch live to the artist. During the presentation, you can ask questions um, uh, in the comments, and whatever questions we receive, we will pass them on to the artist. And to end everything off, we will see the artist working in his uh, workshop and from there, we'll just say goodbye, and you can continue looking at the exhibition virtually all by yourselves. That's the plan for today. So, welcome. Welcome, Pedro Pablo Oliva. Uh, I will now start switching over to Cuba. If can I could just add, this, this was a, a really tough uh, uh, setup because we tried different platforms. Uh, that could work on on Cuba and also at the same time <clears throat> in live streaming. <clears throat> so what we ended up, I hope it will work, is that we are connecting now through Johan's phone uh, to WhatsApp, and that WhatsApp is connected. The phone is connected to his computer, and WhatsApp is streaming a live call with Cuba. Aha. Uh -huh, okay. Hello. Hello. So, we are now streaming WhatsApp directly to the Facebook stream. And welcome from Zurich and Belgrade to Pinal del Rio. Hi there. Here you have the artist. Hello. <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Buenas tardes, Pablo Oliva. Que disfruten su comida. Carmen y yo los saludamos. So Carmen and I, we are greeting you from Cuba. It is lunchtime now in Cuba. <laughs> Estamos aquí. Muchas gracias para participar, Pedro Pablo Oliva. Es un honor para nosotros tener las obras de sí. 50 años de trabajo en una exhibición virtual y estar capaz de hablar juntos en el mundo entero con Cuba, Suiza, Serbia y no sabemos de dónde la gente está mirando del mundo entero para presentar esta exhibición de los cinco décadas de obras fantásticas. Además, vamos a tener un poquito más detallado, uh, David, hablando de las tres obras grandes que están en la sala. 
Y aquí estamos. Muchas gracias para la participación, Pedro Pablo. Gracias, Martín. We will now, maybe I can just do a, a short introduction before we enter the exhibition. So what we will, uh, what we are about to see is a virtual exhibition presented in we, what we call a web viewer on VR or art platform. Uh, the whole exhibition is created completely virtually, which means that all the paintings are uh, placed uh, on the walls virtually. We have the virtual exhibition space and it's an amazing opportunity to present paintings from a painter that is um, from from Cuba and across across the ocean and uh, sometimes a, a really difficult situation is actually to exhibit something you know in in a, a difficult um, let's say environment from it, it is very difficult for for an artist to to uh, transport art pieces and Johan can tell you more about it from Cuba to to Europe and then to present that so this is a new way that that we can uh, have a global let's say uh, art uh, exhibitions uh, available online, available uh, on in the web, but also available in virtual reality. So I will just now share my screen and uh, give you an example of how this uh, looks. So this is the screen of the exhibition. Uh, the link is uh, on our website and you can see it when you go to VR exhibitions here at the top when you land on vrolart.com. And then when you go to VR exhibitions, actually I can show you now, uh, we have now featured uh, uh, this exhibition. And when you click on view exhibition, you can actually go to uh, uh, the exhibition page and then the exhibition will load up. So when it's downloading, you just wait a little bit, then it, it launches. You need to, if you're first time on VRLart website, you need to register by entering, leaving your email. Uh, so uh, please do so. And then you can enjoy the exhibition yourself. So um, what I will do now, I will go quickly to the full screen and I'll show you how you can uh, effectively go through the exhibition. So the first time I move, I click on the floor. And then, I don't know if, if you can hear this, but this is an audio tour that starts automatically when you launch the exhibition. So the audio tour can be um, controlled here and in the top part of the screen. And uh, you literally just click, drag, and you can see the space and you can see the exhibition and you can very easily nav navigate it. So it's like drag uh, the exhibition window and then you can literally go from one piece to another, click on the floor to move, and then you can just get closer to the image and see all the details of uh, presented paintings. So what is here interesting is that you can also use uh, the keys to navigate. It's almost like a computer game. And you can just use um, A, W, S, and D. They're shown here, but you can also use the arrow keys. And this is how I'm moving through the virtual space and virtual exhibition. And I will now just focus on one piece. And Johan told me that we can show this, right, Johan? So if I click on the piece here, and you can see this piece um, in the exhibition window, Johan, maybe you can <clears throat> just say something so that Zoom focuses uh, you in the live. Yes, hello. Yeah, so this piece that you see uh, on uh, the screen and in virtual exhibition is actually the piece that Johan has on his wall in his gallery just uh, just behind his back but so you can see that the real one let's see yes find out. yeah what is also important is that johan was so kind to enter the description of the each piece and to tell us a story about each of the pieces so when you click on the piece you get also an audio tour about the, each of the pieces an explanation of, of the pieces in the exhibition. So maybe, no, Johan, you can tell us now a little bit about uh, the exhibition. This exhibition that we have laid out here shows paintings from 1974 until now, until today. Uh, and each of them has been selected because of some special characteristic that actually um, is typical for his work. So in the first one that we've just seen, you can see that he actually also paints a lot of poetry of Cuban art, of Cuban poets. 
Uh, here you can see something about the circus that um, has fascinated him for a long time because the circus is also very much um, reflecting what's happening in real life. You find real life characters in the circus characters and vice versa. So you can use circus paintings to paint real life situations. Uh, women have always been a, a very important topic for the artist. The human state of mind, uh, how do we work, do we always say what we think or what is the public and private part of me. Uh, you can see that in, as an example in this painting. I will not go into details painting by painting anymore because I think you should be able to, exactly because you have the virtual reality exhibition at your disposition, you can go from painting to painting and listen to the explanations of each painting and uh, why we have selected that painting for that exhibition. I would like to change now and bring in um, Silvia Oliva and David Horta uh, onto the live stream to um, so you can actually hear about the three most important works in the exhibition. Okay, so while, while we are doing this, uh, I would just uh, like to say again and, and invite people uh, maybe after the live show um, to visit VR All Art website and to browse through the exhibition by themselves. And this is the, the um, biggest beauty of, of VR All Art is that people can actually go there themselves and enjoy it anytime they like. Um, so one more thing to add before we start the video is a very important note is that we will uh, go live with a VR, so virtual reality part of the platform, probably in September. So um, we have it, uh, we are using it in, in a, let's say, private mode, but a full public version of VR All Art on VR headsets will be available uh, uh, in September. And all the exhibitions that are published on the platform in the meantime will be available uh, on, on the uh, VR version of, of the um, app. And then, uh, of course, you can, you can also go to uh, this exhibition in, on, on the, your VR headsets. <laughs> Welcome to the main art studio of Pedro Pablo Oliva in his hometown in Pinar del Rio, Cuba. Today, we are opening a singular exhibition. This is a virtual exhibition of works by Master Pedro Pablo Oliva, made possible thanks to the initiative and cooperation of Art Amorphosis Gallery in Switzerland. First, we want you to know a little about the visual universe of Pedro Pablo Oliva. We will show you three masterpieces in our collection that you can only see here in the studio. David Horta, critic and curator, will make a brief presentation of these three paintings where Oliva makes a chronicle of key moments in the recent history of Cuba. Welcome to the world of Pedro Pablo Oliva. <music> Behind me, you will find the unfinished miracle of the bread and the fish. This is one of the most important uh, masterpieces which uh, the master has kept for himself in his own private collection in his studio and residence. The unfinished miracle of the bread and the fish is part of a very long series which the artist started in the mid-1980s and uh, which is called uh, Wicker Work Chairs or Wicker Chairs. The title of the series Wicker Work Chair comes after the key uh, central element which appears in every single painting of the series. This very uh, typical wicker work chairs which we found in many Cuban houses where the artist places uh, all kinds of characters that sit down there to have conversations take a nap, dream, talk about love, sometimes even make love, and at times also key players in the Cuban political arena, like in this case. Because the painting, The Unfinished Miracle of the Bread and the Fish, was made after the visit of John Paul II, the late Pope of the Catholic Church, 
in 1998. This is Oliva's uh, visual documentary of the visit of John Paul II to Cuba. After decades of a very hostile and conflicted relationship between the church and the government, the visit of the Pope of John Paul II to Cuba in 1998 uh, was received as a kind of uh, a sign of change, a sign that new times were uh, opening. So there was so much expectation about this visit. Everybody expected changes to happen. Changes of the relationship between the church and the state, social, economic changes, changes in our uh, civil liberties. And uh, well, some of those changes actually happened and some of them never happened at all. So that is probably why the title of the painting uh, chosen by the artist the unfinished miracle of the bread and the fish. The painting was made in 1998, or actually it started in 1998. The artist signed the painting uh, using the date where he came up with the idea of documenting this very important visit, but it was finished two years later. As you can see, it's a very large canvas and it's a, a very complex work, both formally and conceptually speaking. The painting was conceived to resemble one of those altarpieces which we find in very old churches, with a central panel and two lateral panels. In the painting, Oliva, as in many other masterpieces, mixes personal anecdotes, personal events uh, happening in his uh, private life and also political and social events unfolding in Cuban reality at the time of the, the central panel made. and two lateral panels. In the painting, in the central Oliva, panel, we find the resemblances of Fidel Castro himself and uh, John Paul II carrying a fish on their lap. On the side of Fidel Castro, we will find many uh, elements which refer to uh, some very well-known uh, religious symbolisms like the fallen angel, like for instance uh, the tree of knowledge or the tree of life, Adam and Eve, the original sin. On the right panel we find one of the key uh, references to the Cuban uh, political and social circumstance back in those years. Uh, speci specifically, the one that refers to the situation of uh, the political opposition in Cuba. Here, Oliva includes in the part of the painting which has not been finished, so the unfinished project, an image of the members of uh, La Patria es de Todos. That was the name of uh, the key opposition party that came out on those years. Fatherland is for all. Here, you, you find the members of that party. The unfinished miracle of the bread and the fish is one of the most iconic pieces made by Oliva to this day. It is also one of the uh, examples of why he's been known as a chronicler of his times. And it's one of the most important masterpieces still in place in his own residence and studio in Pinado Rio. <laughs> The Gran Abuelo, the Big Grandfather, or the Great Grandfather, was a series of uh, portraits of Fidel Castro made by Pedro Paulo Oliva um, starting in 2003. It was a series of very uh, strange and unusual portraits of Fidel Castro by any standard. Uh, we humans were used to the image of a leader. Of course, we saw him in every single you know, billboard, picture, film, on television. And um, Oliva came with this uh, serious and a very different approach to the image of the leader. Here in The Great Grandfather, that's the title of the painting, was the second painting uh, uh, of the series and one of the key masterpieces in the series. We see this very old man, gray hair, his eyes closed, sitting on an armchair with a cat on his lap, and uh, the usual commander-in-chief uniform, uh, the military fatigue we were so used to, has been turned into pajamas. This was a really odd image for us Cubans when it came out. 
we were not used to it. Uh, Fidel Castro was also, when we, we went on, on, on the public presentation, he was uh, always uh, standing, always uh, like ready, ready for, for a fight. You know, he was full of energy, full of tension. Even when he was sitting in a Congress or a summit, he was so full of tension that it seemed as if at some point he would stand up and uh, start talking. But this is such a quiet image that you can even see this fruit making a balancing act on the leader's head. And these lizards or chameleons are thriving around him. And he's like in the midst of a green ectoplasm, an eerie atmosphere, like otherworldly, like unreal. So the painting was not very well received, and since it came out, it has not been allowed to be publicly displayed. It can only be found here in the artist's main studio in Pinar de Rio. Uh, it's one of the masterpieces in the artist's own uh, collection. The reasons why this is such a controversial image and it has not been allowed to be publicly displayed is uh, it may be uh, may seem obvious at uh, first time. All things Cuban, of course, uh, this image of Pedro Pablo Oliva was uh, subject to many interpretations, political interpretations uh, especially. There were those uh, on the other side of the Florida Strait that thought that the artist was being far too ambiguous, ambivalent in representing the image of what they thought was a ruthless uh, dictator that had suppressed civil liberties in, in Cuba and has dealt this country into uh, despair, into economic uh, crisis. And uh, on the other side, the uh, cultural officials of the Cuban government thought he was being disrespectful, he was being subversive, and he was giving ideological and symbolic weapons to the enemy uh, to uh, discredit the, the image of the leader. What is true and what is false is difficult to say because actually the series has got nothing to do with the political interpretation of the leader as it has to do with a human interpretation of, the, of this image, which was very important for Oliva. Uh, Oliva was 10 years old in 1959, so he knew, since he was a little child he was used to see uh, this image and it was part of his life, he was part of the revolution. And um, the title of the series, uh, The Great Grandfather, probably has to do with that. Uh, Fidel Castro, in a way, could be seen as Oliva's grandfather. The artist has been reluctant to give the ultimate meaning of this painting, or of the whole series. But he has said something that uh, can make us understand what it is all about. His sole intention was to portray the human dimension of someone that for us Cubans was simply a social construct, the result of propaganda, a myth, a semi-god, which we saw every day of our lives in all those billboards and films and pictures. So there came a moment where Oliva realized that we didn't know him. I mean, who are you? How did we come to this? Was this true? And uh, since all we know about you are these images, these films, who are you in real life? How are you as a human being? And that's what the series is all about. Oliva's attempt to portray the humanity of someone we actually didn't know. <laughs> The Gran Apagón, The Great Blackout, was made in 1994. It is by far the best known painting made by Pedro Pablo Oliva to this date. It is part of a whole series of paintings made in the first half of the 1990s called Shelters. The painting was made at the peak of the worst economic, social and political crisis we've been through in Cuba. Right after the fall of socialism in Eastern Europe, and in every single aspect, the painting tries to mimic what we felt, what we saw, and what we expected uh, of the future back in those days. After the collapse of socialism in Eastern Europe, 
Cuban leaders started speaking constantly in every single uh, public speech about the imminent invasion by the United States to Cuba. We were the right fruit we were ready to be taken. We were no longer under the economic, political and military protectorate of the Soviet Union and the socialist country. So there was this sense of, uh, of danger, of, ur of urgency and this paranoia. And there was a program uh, in, in the whole island in which uh, with uh, aid from the government in every community, every working center, every school, um, we started building small bunkers or uh, galleries on the ground, uh, shelters, to prepare for this supposed to come invasion from the United States. That's where the title of the series, Shelters, come from. And all the paintings of the series uh, have in common this uh, specific element, these bands here and up there, which uh, were made to depict a cross-section of an underground gallery where uh, everything in the painting happened. The shelters were not the only uh, common element, commonplace element in the scenario back in the early 90s. There were also the blackouts, very long power cuts, 12 hours long, 8 hours long power cuts that we suffer because of shortage of fuel. You couldn't even see your own hands in the middle of the night. So the great blackout refers to those times of darkness. But of course, not only physical darkness, it is also a metaphorical uh, darkness. It refers to another sense, another meaning of the expression blackout, which is a temporary loss of consciousness. The whole world became dark. You can imagine, for us the world was you know, safe and sound. It was uh, very, really easy to understand. Uh, it was as easy as to understand that there was good and evil, East and West, socialism and capitalism. And all of a sudden, with the collapse of socialism, all this mental framework that made our world so safe and sound, so easy to understand, crumbled to the ground. And all certainties went down with it. Where are we? What is truth anymore? If this was not as solid as it seemed, what is solid anymore? Where do we come from and where are we going? All these questions were part of our daily lives back in those times. And uh, the Grey Blackout depicts this uh, uncertainty, this uh, sense of urgency, this perception of danger, this uncertainty about the future. In the words of the artist himself, the Great Blackout is his own personal vision of the political uh, environment, of the psychological uh, atmosphere, of the state of mind of Cuba back in those years. So you can see this painting as a kind of a, a metaphor. This is Cuba, underground, isolated in its own self, fearing the outside and in the middle of a blackout, where you cannot see clearly what lies uh, in front of you. Which is probably why s there are so many eyes in the painting and so many characters trying to uh, carry a candle, trying to see through darkness. So hard that their eyes uh, uh, pop out. Elements in the painting that uh, turned it into a very uh, controversial uh, topic of discussion back in 1995 when it was exhibited for the first time at the National Museum of Fine Arts in Havana. Some of those elements are very uh, easy to, to understand. For instance, we have this area here. We have this element which was a, um, a point of discussion. This is a podium with a Cuban flag. The only place in the painting where there is this, uh, this vertical light uh, falling on it. And uh, the podium is empty. Here on the left we see uh, Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader. The Great Blackout for the artist is a synthesis of Cuba and Cubans. It is a multi-layer portrait of Cuban social, political and spiritual life a circumstance full of shadows and light and the fight between them. It is a country 
trying to find its way out of the tunnel. When it was for the first time exhibited, it has been known as the Cuban Guernica. Of course, as a comparison to Pablo Picasso's famous uh, mural painting. The artist both likes and dislikes the comparison. He says that, of course, who wouldn't like to be compared to Picasso? But on the other hand, he says that, if any, this is a uh, Cuban Guernica. If the uh, Picasso and Guernica was a disenchanted a song to modernity coming out of destruction and death, the Grey Blackout is actually, it's actually a song of life, a song to the light. So we are back in the house and the studio of the artist. Hello, this is Silvia and Leonora. Leonora, Leonora. And we are now stepping through the studio where the works that we see in the virtual reality are really hanging. So there are the works ready to be displayed in the museum one of these days, I guess. You can see that he does a lot of bronzes. He's the artist, but we are going back to him to say Thank you very much for the works and thank you very much for the display taking part. And so, we have come to the point where we say goodbye, muchas gracias maestro, hemos visto mucho de las obras, hemos escuchado de David contando, explicando las obras, y son 50 años de una obra tremenda, y lo felicitamos. No tenemos muchas preguntas desde de, el internet. Pero los gentes están saludando, felicitando y diciendo muchas gracias para las obras que están disfrutando mucho en el mundo entero. Y las preguntas, bueno, a mí me parece son más importantes para ellas a decir gracias para todas las obras, para todo lo que han hecho para el arte cubano, que preguntar. Entonces lo dejamos así. Pedro Pablo Oliva, muchas gracias para participar en ese evento experimental, pero vamos a ver cómo mejoramos esto cada vez y que tenemos mucha gente que pueden tener acceso a las obras que se quedan en Cuba y así se pueden ver en el mundo entero. Gracias para participar, Pedro Pablo Oliva. Gracias a ustedes. Me han dicho que van a bajar un momento al taller con la cámara para que veamos en este momento que, en qué está trabajando el maestro. Eso es el camino. This is the way down to the workshop of Pedro Pablo. And here we can have a sneak preview of the works that are being worked on at the moment. With this oh, tell us, Johan, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of more, uh, more about how he's actually managing to work even though uh, his hands are shaking? You told me that, that when he starts painting, actually, he can keep the hand still. Yes, if we can look at the paintings that he's working on right now, the lines look actually very well. It, uh, he has um, Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, if, you, if you know that disease that makes your body move uh, involuntar uh, un involuntarily and it's very hard to keep your body parts in, uh, under control. But as soon as the artist starts working 
and he takes pen, pencil or paintbrush in his hands, then you can see that something else in the, uh, in the brain starts working and he's training and he does it every day and he keeps a rigid training day by day. His training keeps him using his hand and his line stays precise at his head, as it has been. Whilst he's not able to control his arm movements in daily movements, as soon as he goes and takes his pencils, he is able to do the beautiful works as always, as you can see here on the works he's working on at this very moment. This is amazing. Like it, it gives me goosebumps. It's, <laughs> it's very it's, moment. It's it's, but I think it's really. 50 years of doing nothing but art and taking the, the, the paintbrushes, pencils uh, in your hands, then your brain starts working for that kind of work in a different way than with daily movements. So whilst it is hard to hold a spoon to eat, he can still paint in, in the manner, manner he does. And I think we are all very happy that that is possible and that he's still keeping up the discipline, the very hard discipline, daily work. So he keeps that um, control over, over the movements. Fantastic. And on, on how many pieces he's working now, do we know? Well, as you can see, there are very many pieces uh, in the workshop at the moment. And that does not mean he's working on all at the time. He's got a habit of starting a work and then maybe he says, okay, I've worked on it enough. Then he puts it on the side and it stays there until he has the idea how to complete that work. So actually he can be working on tens, if not hundreds of works in parallel. Does not mean he's working every day on each one of them, but he will put them aside and then once he says, now the time has come to continue and he's ripe to continue on that work, he will take that out again and, and continue on that single work. So actually you can say on tens, if not hundreds, but uh, in reality, um, uh, they are waiting for a while. So Sylvia is there. They've been showing us a lot of, uh, of the works. Muchas gracias, Sylvia. Gracias a ustedes. Muchas gracias, David. Gracias a ustedes. Thank you. you very much. It has been a real big honor. Yeah, it's dropped out again. So we say goodbye from here. We say goodbye from here. We had some technical issues, but we have been able to have direct, direct connections from Cuba to streaming here and I think that is a big success because just a few months ago this would have not been possible. The same True. with streaming from the artist directly as well as having a platform like We Are All Art to represent the exhibitions directly uh, on your browser at home. So, uh, thank you everybody and this video uh, we have recorded it so we will uh, post the video to YouTube, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn uh, and probably also on our website. So thank you all for being here live and thanks for the future audience that will come to see the video uh, on other social net, uh, social media platforms. So uh, uh, yeah, thank you. We are stopping now.